So good morning, everybody. This was a little passion project of mine. Um, I decided to do this presentation as it kind of fits in with the current state of the world. So without further ado, we'll start. It's the particulates and fibers and how they enter the respiratory system and how you can protect yourself. So just some presentation objectives. It was to gain awareness of the respiratory system and how it protects you, an entry-level awareness on how to control particulate hazards, define key elements of the respiratory system, awareness of the hierarchy of controls, and basic measures on how to avoid pathogens entering the human body. So I just wanna go over some definitions that I'm gonna be using during the presentation here. So particulate. Particulate matter is the name given to solids or liquids that are distributed in a gaseous medium. Fiber. A fiber is defined as a particle that is more than five micrometers in length and having a length to width ratio of at least three to one. A pathogen is a bacteria, virus, or other microorganism that can cause disease. And a virus is an infective agent that is too small to be seen by light microscopy and is able to multiply only within the living cells of a host. Bacteria is a microscopic living organism, usually one cell that can be found everywhere and they can be dangerous or very beneficial as the ones that are in our gut and as we talk about with gut health. Um, so a micrometer is equal to one one millionth of a meter. It's also known as a micron. And just branching off of that, a nanometer is equal to one one billionth of a meter. So this is just an introduction to the hierarchy of controls. So elimination, substitution, they all fit into engineering controls. The next step down is administrative controls, and then there's personal protective equipment. So PPE is always our last line of defense, or as noted here, least effective to most effective. So routes of entry. So inhalation is the most important route of exposure in the workplace, because when particles are in the air, there is a good chance you're gonna inhale them. Inhalation is the most important route of exposure in the workplace, because a person working at a moderate level breathes 8.5 meters cubed of air, which is about 8,500 liters of air during an eight hour work shift. So to get the idea of the capacity of the lungs, remember that your total skin surface area is only about 1.9 meters squared. So about 3.6 meters of skin surface area. So your lungs by far provide you with the closest and most extensive contact with the outside world. So the what happens also depends on the chemical and toxic properties of the material that you're gonna inhale. Particles are deposited in the lungs by one of four different ways. So they're called interception, impaction, sedimentation, and diffusion. And we'll, I'll quickly go over those in a minute. And how far the particle gets into the air passages of the, your respiratory system and what it does when it is deposited depends on the size, shape, and density of a particular material. So this is just a picture of the respiratory system. So it starts with the nose, where there's bones and cartilage that make inhaled air swirl so that large particles end up in here. Um, your mouth doesn't have any filtering system of that sort but the same routes go down into your bronch bronchus and your bronchioles. And down here, you can't really see them that well, but they are called alveoli and they are tiny air sacs at the end of each bronchiole. And what those are, are, are the gas exchange regions. So that's where your body turns oxygen, gives it to your blood, and then the carbon dioxide comes up and it goes back out. So as I mentioned earlier, interception, <clears throat> a particle is intercepted or deposited when it travels so close to a surface of the airway um, that an edge of the particle touches the surface. So as you can see, it, it's not gonna follow the airway, it just goes into the side here. 
This method of deposition is most important for fibers such as asbestos. The fiber length de determines where the particle will be intercepted. For example, um, fibers with a diameter of one micrometer and a length of 200 micrometers would be deposited in the bronchial tree, as well as other particles. Um, they'll just end up here. And then using what's called the mucociliary escalator, your body will actually pull the particles back up and out of your mouth. Um, that'll be later on as well. So impaction. Um, when particles are suspended in air, they have a tendency to travel along their original path. So when there's a bend in the airway system, for example, in your nose, there are many particles do not turn with the air, but rather stick to the surface on the part particulate's original path. So imagine the nose breathing in right here, and it doesn't turn with the airways. The likelihood of impaction depends on the air velocity and the particle's mass. So typically, most particles greater than 10 micrometers in aerodynamic diameter are deposited in the nose or throat and cannot penetrate the lower or the deeper tissues of the respiratory tract. Sedimentation. So this is an interesting one. So as particles travel through air, gravitational forces and air resistance eventually overcome their buoyancy. So buoyancy is the tendency for the, for the particle to stay up in the air. So just as outside of the body, there is gravity inside and it will eventually, or most large particles will eventually settle onto the bronchial, the bronchus, or somewhere in the respiratory system that's not getting to the deeper areas. This type of deposition is most common, like I said, in the bronchi. Um, and sedimentation is not an important factor when the aerodynamic diameter of the particle is less than 0 0.5 micrometers. And then the last one is diffusion, which is also known as the Brownian motion. So this is the random motion of particles and similar to gas molecules in the air when particles are smaller than 0 0.5 micrometers. So what happens here is these particulates are so small that they don't react like um, particles, they act like a gas. So they'll bounce off of each other, noted by the squiggly lines here. So each turn is a reaction from hitting a different molecule, and eventually it will stick to the side of the lungs. So this, this is very common for asbestos to reach um, the alveoli regions, and that's when asbestosis becomes dangerous. So I'm just gonna go over some basic engineering controlling strategies for airborne particulates. You're gonna to wanna to control dust at the source, so ways you can do that is using a water pumping saw when cutting stone to keep the dust down, avoid breathing in silica particulates, use what's called local exhaust ventilation, otherwise known as fume hoods, similar devices, and then dilution ventilation slash building ventilation. So that just means having enough air to replace the contaminated air as long as the concentration is low enough. Sometimes that's not plausible, to control out the source, so you separate the person that's doing the work into a different area. So an example of that is sandblasting done away from other workers to reduce their risk, asbestos abatement work, um, and people running vehicles out of the mechanic shop to test them instead of inside where dangerous hydrocarbons can stay in the air. Another thing you can do is change the process, and a good example of that is substituting airless paint spraying equipment for the conventional spray painting equipment that releases more uh, aerosol into the air. So administrative control strategies for airborne particulates. So an administrative control is something a company implements to help work process become safer. So you can do that with work practices, safe job procedures. You can train employees for the tasks they're going to complete and others you'll get them to do. Um, again, some more on-the-job training by reviewing SDS sheets for the hazardous products if workers are unfamiliar so that they can be aware of the inhalation hazards as well as absorption and ingestion. Having excellent housekeeping programs and sweeping floors will keep nuisance dust down. 
as well as reduce the risk that certain things will get to a level. So personal protective control strategies, you would want to use to correct PPE as outlined by OHS regulations, safe job practices, work practices, SDS sheet information, any governing body that tells you you have to wear the PPE as long as you don't have other controls in place or the controls are not at fully adequate. And you're gonna to wanna to choose the correct air purifying respirator with the correct cartridges or an air supplying respirator if it is immediately dangerous to life and health. And you're gonna to wanna to ensure either of those devices are fit tested to a specific worker. So going off of that, we're gonna jump right into respiratory protection, which again is your last line of defense. So an air purifying respirator work by removing gases, vapors, aerosols. So aerosol means a droplet or solid particulate in a gas medium, such as air, or a combination of contaminants from the air through the use of filters, cartridges, or canisters. And like I said before, it is definitely imperative that a person uses the correct filters because a filter for gas will not work for particulates and a filter for particulates will not work for gas. These respirators do not supply oxygen and therefore cannot be used in an atmosphere that is oxygen deficient, meaning it's less than 19.5% oxygen or immediately dangerous to life or health. The, the appropriate respirator for a particular situation will depend on the environmental contaminant. So air purifying respirators must undergo qualitative, quantitative fit testing done by a qualified individual. And it's imperative as well that workers who use these air purifying respirators are clean shaven. So here are some common types of air purifying respirators. These are very common in the construction industry. So a disposable respirator, also better known as a dust mask, or N95, P95, N100, P100. So that's a very common mask. And a elastomeric half piece respirator. So right here, this is common in <clears throat> construction as well. But for the, for the sake of doing a hazard assessment, if you look at the SDS sheet of some materials, it will note that there, it is an eye sensitizer. So if, if that is the case, you have to get a mask that looks like this so it can protect your eyes as well as your respiratory system. So when you take a look at the masks that we get on a regular basis, the most common is an N95. So what that means is it's not resistant to oil and it filters at least 95 of percent of airborne particulates. So that's its efficiency rating. The P means some resistance to oil. And the R, oh, pardon me, the P means strongly resistant and R means some resistance. So when you take a look at the other efficiencies, they're 99, which is filters at least 99% of the airborne particulates. And when they say N100 or P100, it means it filters at least 99.7% of airborne particulates. And again, these efficiencies only work and are accurate if the respirator fits and is fit tested. So to compare an N95 mask to the surgical style mask, just for the state of the world currently, these are some of the major differences. So the N95 designation means that when subject, subjected to careful testing, the respirator will block at least 95% of very small particulates. So 0 0.3 micron test particles. These must be fit tested. They are disposable after each use and they are being saved for medical professionals or occupations that normally require this protection. So these masks are designed to protect the wearer. So in a situation where we're going to a grocery store, the surgical mask is meant to block large particulate droplets, splashes, sprays, or splatter that may contain pathogens, keeping it from reaching your mouth and nose. And these are as well disposable after each use. So these have almost no partic particulate protection as well as they don't seal to your face. So what they're good for is when you cough or when you sneeze to practice respiratory etiquette for other people. So to branch off of this, 
Asbestos is the big name in particulates getting into the lung. So we're going to go over it, asbestos and its dangers. So where was asbestos used and what is it? So asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral that was used in many residential and commercial building materials from the 1950s up until the 1990s because of its strong fibers and resistance to fire. When asbestos is deserved, disturbed pardon me, during res renovations, tiny asbestos fibers are released into the air and inhaled. Asbest asbestos fibers can get trapped into the lungs and cause serious health problems in the future, such as asbestosis, mesothelioma, and lung cancer. Asbestos is dangerous due to the way the fibers break down. So the diameter of the fiber continues to break into smaller sizes, which means it can um, get into the lower parts of the lung quite easily. And when, when those particulates do get into the lower areas of the lung, they form what's called fibrosis, which is scarring of the lung. And that reduces the amount of oxygen that you can transport to your blood in the long run. Um, so it was used in flooring products, plaster, drywall joint compound, thermal insulators, fireproofing and acoustic ceiling tiles, and many other locations as noted by this little picture here. So some of the effects on the body. Asbestos related lung diseases are the cause of many workplace fatalities in the province of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> in particular, mesophilioma and other asbestos related lung diseases were responsible for approximately 23% of the 388 fatalities accepted by the Saskatchewan WCB in the last decade. So that's an extraordinarily high number for something that was last used 20 years, 30 years ago, potentially. So in 2018, 42% of the workplace fatalities were a direct result of occupational diseases. While many of these asbestos related diseases are from the past practices decades ago, actions can be taken today to reduce the exposure to this hazard. So some control strategies. Without proper training, equipment and procedures, attempting to remove asbestos contaminated materials can quickly put everybody at risk. So on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see a hoarding and that is the appropriate control for an asbestos related um, situation. So people that are trained and qualified will set this up and ensure that it is airtight so that they cannot spread to other areas in the building. So it's imperative that if we find asbestos or we think we have asbestos, we call someone that is professional and knows what they're doing. If the proper respirator worn, it can protect an individual, but it will not prevent the hazardous asbestos fibers from becoming airborne and potentially contaminating other areas. So again, you just want to be sure that you have to be trained as well as qualified to be doing these jobs. So I know I've mentioned that you have to be clean shaven when wearing a respirator, and this is why. So when you wear a respirator and it's fit tested, it has to have 100% seal to your face for that 99.7 to be actually accurate. So if you look here, this is the size of a human hair which is about, I would say about 70 micrometers across. And if you look at the asbestos fiber here, it's less than one or maybe even 0.5 micrometers. So if you aren't clean shaven, these fibers will have no problem bypassing the mask. Well, from there, we're gonna jump right into pathogens. So a pathogen is a bacterium, virus, or other microorganism that can cause disease. Starting with viruses. So a virus is an infectious agent of small size and simple composition that can multiply only in living cells of animals, plants, or bacteria. So they are considered the smallest living thing. They range in size from about 20 to 400 nanometers. So again, one one billionth of a meter in diameter. These infections are contagious for varying periods of time depending on the virus. <clears throat> so when we hear the word incubation, 
that refers to the time between exposure to the virus or the other pathogen and the emergence of symptoms. It doesn't necessarily um, work with the contagious period and it's not, near, not necessarily the same, pardon me. So some types of viral infections. So there's a respiratory viral infection that affects the nose, lungs, and throat. Because those droplets are so large, that's where they are deposited. And that's the type of um, respiratory viral infection that we're dealing with right now in the world. So these viruses are most commonly spread by inhaling droplets containing the virus particles. <clears throat> Droplets generated by coughing or sneezing are much larger than the virus contained in them. Just as regular particulates, the size in micrometers determines where they will be deposited. Some other viruses can spread through touch, saliva, blood, or even the air. <clears throat> Some viruses can be transmitted through sexual contact or by sharing contaminated needles, um, as well as some insects, including ticks and mosquitoes, can act as what's called a vector and transmit a virus from one host to another. Contaminated food and water are other potential sources of viral infections. So the COVID-19 virus is a respiratory viral infection and can be transmitted through touching your face, nose, and mouth, just because that goes into the respiratory system. COVID-19 cannot be transmitted through mosquito bites. <clears throat> And pardon me, studies have shown that COVID-19 virus can survive up to 72 hours on plastic and stainless steel, and less than four hours on copper and less than 24 hours on cardboard. And that's from the CDC. So to, to give a good um, visual on how small a virus is, we we'll look at the coronavirus here. So it's 0 0.1 micrometers, which is smaller than a bacteria which is smaller than a particulate matter of 2.5 micrometers, and red blood cell, and a particulate matter of 10. So this is the size that will get stuck in your nose. So the size of the droplet, and the coronavirus would be in the droplet of that size, and that's where it depends how it gets deposited. So how you can protect yourself and others from, from the COVID-19 and other respiratory viral infections. So if you're feeling ill, don't go to work sick. Frequent hand washing, covering of the mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing, which is known as respiratory etiquette, and physical distancing can re all reduce the spread of these infections. So disinfecting hard surfaces with an EPA registered disinfectant and not touching the eyes, nose, and mouth will also help reduce transmission. So when you wash your hands, Antimicrobial hand soap is a preferred method to remove pathogens from exposed skin. As well, using a minimum 70% alcohol hand sanitizer is effective as well. We're gonna go to bacteria now. So bacteria are similar but different to a virus. So bacteria are found in every habitat on earth, soil, rock, oceans, and even Arctic snow. There are approximately 10 times as many bacterial cells as human cells in the body. So again, there's almost 10,000 different bacteria in your gut alone. So those bacteria are all good bacteria and they, they help and assist antibodies in your body to remove pathogens, other microbes, and they just help you out. But that being said, there's also the, the bacteria that grow and aren't your friend. So we have to protect against them as well. Bacteria can spread when residue from evaporated droplets or dust particles containing microorganisms is suspended in air for long periods of time. And that's what's known as a bioaerosol. So for example, if you had a diffuser in your house that you never change the water on regularly, or even a coffee maker, bacteria loves to enter something like that because it's a water reservoir. And that's where bacteria thrives, is in standing water. So some other pathogens that I'd like to talk about, a fungi, which is any member of the group of eukaryotic organisms, such as yeasts and molds, as well as the more familiar mushrooms. And there's a protozoa, which is an informal term for a single-celled eukaryote, either free-living or parasitic, 
which will feed on organic matters such as other microorganisms or organic tissues and debris. A worm, which is known as a helm myth, unlike any other pathogen. Um, these worms do not proliferate within their hosts. Worms grow, molt, mature, and then they produce the offspring, which are avoided from the host to infect others. So now, with all we've learned about the respiratory system, we're going to learn about how your body defends yourself against the foreign material and pathogens. So how breathing through the nose will protect you. The nose acts as a filter and an air conditioning for the air coming into your body. In general, particles having aerodynamic diameter of greater than 10 micrometers are deposited in the upper airway passages. So your nose, nasal cavity, and throat, largely what's known as impaction. That's because all the twists and turns that your body has naturally to collect those particles. This mechanism is prominent because of the high airspeed and the many turns in the nasopharyngeal airway. The changes in airflow direction cause many particles to hit the walls of the air passage, and so particles deposit or settle in this region. So going off of that, this is what the mucociliary escalator is. So this is one of the most advanced part of your bodies. Um, so the mucociliary escalator is the apparatus that removes most foreign particles from your respiratory system. And it does so with the cilia. So the cilia, to, to look at it like this, are little arms that form a wave. So they go up towards your throat and they carry the mucus. And the reason we have mucus is so that we can get rid of the particles that we breathe in. So you might notice that you might become more stuffed up when you are in contact with dust, different particulates, that is a form of your, of your body removing these particles from your body. So the mucociliary escalator is found in the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. And the only place that the, the mucociliary escalator cannot get to is the alveoles, which is where asbestos goes to, and that's why your body cannot remove those fibers. So immune system and your other defenses. The immune system is complex network of cells, proteins, um, different bacteria that defends the body against infection. So your, your immune system will keep a record of every microbe that enters your body so it can defeat it if it comes back. Skin has a waterproof barrier that secretes oil with bacteria killing properties. So intact skin will defend against most pathogens so long as you don't touch your eyes, your mouth, your nose, and the other entrances to the other rest parts of the respiratory system. So your digestive tract, when you have mucus and it goes up, um, the mucus lining in your stomach contains antibodies and the acid in your stomach will kill most of the microbes. So your body has other defense mechanisms like the saliva and tears containing antibacterial enzymes to help reduce the risk of infection and the constant flushing of the urinary tract in the bowel also helps. So that wraps up what, I, what I've had for the presentation. And if you have need more information on COVID, you can be found at our, on our website, scsaonline.ca. Under the resources tab, click into the COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, there's links to many great topics toolbox talks, different things that'll help your company out if, if you need some of this stuff and you're still working, as well as there's other great links on that webpage that'll take you to many other sources.